Bonsoir tout le monde. J'espère que vous allez bien. And that, of course, for the few of you that may not know, that was Freedom Fry Speak, a.k.a. French, for good evening, and I hope that you're doing well. Thank you, Wally, for stopping by, whether it's quickly or for a long time. I know that I had a live this morning that, thankfully, all of you did participate in, and I'm grateful for any amount of participation that you guys are willing to give me, whether it's just you know, participating in my chat, participating in my panel, or watching this video on replay, or even watching my videos on uh, my playlist, any support that you guys can give is good support. I know as well that um, our friend, our favorite uncle, Uncle Stu, is doing a live right now. So I assume that most of you guys that normally would be here with me or there watching his live at the moment. So it's absolutely fine. I get it. I'm not the only one on YouTube. And as much as I would love that everybody participates in this live, I realize that all of it is um, not everybody's with me. Um, Wally, you're, uh, Joel, you're not getting sound. Um, I'm seeing that I'm being reactive. Let me see one second. Joel, I can. I hope that you can hear me now, um, because I see that um, everything is seems to be fine on my end. So I'm hoping that Joel, that it's not a question of maybe you on your end, but I'll double check. Hello, Peter. Uh, Peter, can, if you can. I'll put a one just to see that at least you hear me. Because um, I want to make sure that Joel can hear me properly. Um, so if you guys can hear me, press a one in uh, the chat just so that I can make sure that I'm allowed. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to reply to Joel because maybe it's an issue on uh, Joel's end in that case. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so uh, Joel seems... Uh, the issue seems to be more on your end, Joel. So just double check, uh, Joel, that your your cell phone, everything is properly connected and working uh, fine on your end because, because Peter seems to be hearing me clearly here. So, okay, Joel, yeah, your phone is glitching. Not surprising. I know my phone sometimes too tends to glitch. So, okay, I'll let Joel, uh, I'll let you figure it out. There's no rush, Joel, don't worry about it. Thank you, Peter and Joel, for being here and supporting me in any way that you guys can. So tonight we're going to be dealing with two different things. Uh, one is a controversy that's been going on in um, the art world here in the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, which is the director of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts being fired, and the other subject being um, what the actual topic or original topic was, which was the um, showing of ecologie and um, an artist, a particular artist called, um, let me get, get her full name. I want to make sure that I have her full name in oh, one second, guys. Let 
Rebecca Belmore. That's the artist. So, uh, but I do want to uh, talk about both because, um, you know, there it's both very interesting. Um, so basically what I'll be doing is I'll try to make it relatively quick because I know that, like I said, I know um, Uncle Stu is currently uh, doing a live and that you guys may not necessarily be giving me your full attention, which is fine. Like I said, look, I don't expect to be the center of attention on YouTube. Uh, I know there's thousands of videos that are being uploaded every day. And I, as much as I appreciate your guys' support, I know that I'm not the sun. I'm not the center of the universe. So I hope that you guys do catch this on the replay for those of you that are uh, watching uh, Uncle Stu's live stream at the moment. So we'll get into it without any further uh, ado. So the first topic at hand tonight will be the controversy of the firing of uh, the director of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. So the director and actually her full title was director and chief curator Nathalie Bondil, of course, I'm pronouncing it the French way, which is uh, Nathalie Bondil. So Natalie Bondil, if I were going to quote unquote anglicize her name, um, she was the first woman who had that position at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, but last summer, she was fired from her post. Um, the accusation was the fact that she was, quote unquote, creating a toxic environment for her employees um, to the point where some of the higher ups actually quit because of her. Now, she claims that these were false accusations and that in reality, uh, these individuals are making these accusations because she did not agree with a particular uh, a person being appointed a job. Um, she felt that this individual um, obtained this position uh, because of her family connections to the museum rather than purely out of merit. Okay. Uh, so the other person that was involved in this controversy is, um, let me get her name properly. Mm -hmm. So the other individual, so Nat Nathalie, um, let me make sure I get everything properly. Nathalie Bondil was accusing uh, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts for hiring people um, for using improper recruitment practices by the Montreal Museum when hiring uh, Marie Dele de Marais, okay, who's actually the um, granddaughter of André de Marais. Now, for those of you who are not part of the art world here in Montreal, uh, the Desmarais fam family. So, for those of you who do not know how to, uh, you know, the, the family Desmarais, D E S M A R A I S. This is a pretty important family in the art world in Montreal. It is a one of the founding families in the art world, uh, particularly for the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. This is a family that is one of the biggest. <coughs> excuse me one of the biggest donors of the Montreal uh, Museum of Fine Arts to the point where one of the pavilions is named after them. They are that much of a big wig in the art world in Montreal. This is not a family to be messed around with. So basically, uh, on the uh, Paul Desmarais, which is uh, Marie Delay, de Marais' grandfather, he was the original uh, family member to donate a major amount of funds to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. So basically, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, guys, sorry. 
the Dimare fam family go hand in hand with the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Without that family, we pretty much at this point would not have the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, or at the very least, it would look very different from what it is. So Nathalie uh, Bondil is accusing uh, Marie Delet de Marais for using her family name in order to get her position, right? Um, to the point where Audrey de Marais, Marie de la, uh, de la, uh, de Marais' uncle, is actually part of uh, the museum's board and is one of uh, the three founding um, founding members who that donate basically part of the 20 million, yes, million dollar donations uh, for the museum, okay? So the Desmarais family is a major player when it comes to art world, the art world in Montreal, right? So this is a family that basically it's Canada's version of uh, the Gates family or um, some such other family, right? So essentially they're accusing that Marie Delay or Nathalie is accusing Marie Delay of using her family uh, name in order to get her position. Um, let me make sure that I get the right title. Because, of course, a lot of this is hearsay. So I do want to make it clear to you guys that none of what I'm saying here is documented, proven facts. It is all um, hearsay and accusations and allegations. Uh, so please don't take what I say as pure fact. Okay. Um so let me get back to the article to see exactly what position she was proposed. But basically, it was one of um, a curator type position. So yeah, she, she got basically um, one of the curator type positions where she would uh, handle some of the new um, works that were being displayed. Um, and it got, the controversy got to the point where um, the Minister of Culture, Nathalie Roy, yes, Roy as in the hockey player, so it's that same family, um, well, no, it's the same family name, I should say. Uh, so R-O-Y, which is French for king, okay? Nathalie Roy had to step in to investigate to see if uh, the firing was a just uh, decision, okay? Now, this is all reported in the Montreal Gazette, okay, which is one of the founding uh, journalists, uh, organizations in in Montreal but it was also reported by another organization which is called uh sorry another um journal which is called Le Devoir or homework but Le Devoir is also uh, obligation in French the the obligation um so uh, in Le Devoir okay they talk about how this has had an impact internationally for the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, basically, um, in their article, um, let me get, in their article published on the 16th of July by uh, 2020 by Pierre Bourgie, uh, they also talked about this firing and how uh, one of the museums in Paris had a, a a deal with the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts 
uh, that was um, helped in all, you know, a lot by Nathalie Bontil, which of course, like I said, the, the woman that got fired, um, that museum decided to uh, halt their uh, link with the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. They were supposed to actually, they had an agreement with the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts that a new exhibit that was going to was supposed to happen at the Montreal exhibit, they canceled it because they were that against the decision of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts to fire Nathalie Bonzil. Um, let me get the name of the exact exhibit so I'm not shooting myself in the foot here, but I believe it had something to do with um, not I'll. Albert Einstein, but with um, so I'm trying to find where they name the actual. Sorry, guys, I had it just a moment ago, but of course, when you need something, it it refreshes and does not give you what you want. Um, one second, guys. It's always like that. When you want something and you can never find it. All right. So I'm just going to have to do this uh, slightly differently, guys. Sorry about this. Oh, yes, Charles Darwin. So basically, it uh, the exhibit that was supposed to happen at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts had to do with Charles Darwin. Um, and I was actually looking forward to this because I saw that it was announced uh, on the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts website that they were going to have this exhibit to do with Charles Darwin and sort of some of the artwork related to evolution and Charles Darwin and so forth. But this uh, French um, museum that handled this exhibit decided because of the firing, they were going to cancel it and not allow the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts to have it. Now, I unfortunately don't have a lot of details as to what exactly was being said or done that would be considered as a toxic environment. So for those of you, since I know that there's nobody technically watching my life, um, for those of you watching in the replay, what can, what would you consider as a toxic environment when you're at work? Because obviously I, I, I would have only speculation as to what would be considered a, a toxic environment for the employees at the, of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. I, I really don't know what Natalie Bonzil could have said or done that would have been considered as a toxic. What, you know, was she swearing? Was she uh, spitting a lot? I, you know, I don't know. You know what I mean? Now, of course, some of uh, you might have heard some of uh, the rumors of um, uh, what's her name, Ellen DeGeneres, creating this toxic environment for her employees, right? Uh, to the point where I think when the pandemic occurred, uh, that she was no longer employing her employees to do the job. Uh, but she had outside individuals coming in to do the work. And of course that, you know, made a lot of people mad and frustrated and they're like, Hey, we, you know, we're ready and willing to work, but here you are hiring people, you know, outside of the union that are not part of your uh, regular crew, et cetera. You know, why is that? Right. So in the comment section, please guys, let me know what, have you experienced a to what you you know a toxic environment? What would you consider as a toxic environment at work? Right? Is it somebody swearing? Is it somebody yelling a lot? Maybe is it how they presented their criticism of you? You know, um, 
you know, what exactly did somebody say that you would consider as toxic? Um, another good question is, is toxic dependent on gender? Is it toxic? Is toxic dependent on ethnicity, right? So do we allow white men, for example, to get away with a lot more uh, than if they were a black woman, for example, right? These are just examples. I'm not saying right or wrong uh, one way or the other that, okay, toxic has to be X, Y, Z, right? Um, I, I do realize that certain amount of quote unquote toxic environment is dependent on personal bias, right? Is dependent on your own beliefs in, uh, in that uh, situation, right? And perhaps for some of us, you know, what is considered as normal maybe um you know toxic for somebody else right so there's room here for personal interpretation and i hope that you guys are honest in your comments um and that you're able to admit that hey this just might be my own individual perception of toxic for instance for me i have no problems with somebody swearing at work i don't i really don't care but the second you start saying, hey, you're crappy at your job while there's a client in front of us, then I would consider that as toxic. Because for me, it's it's not necessarily what you say that's the issue, but really a question of when and how you say it. Um, I have no problems with you uh, saying the F word or the B word or whatever, but hey, let's keep this in-house right let's make sure that if you have a criticism of me or i have a criticism of you that we keep it between us you know that it's not necessarily something that uh we do in front of the public or that we do it in front of the bus if we can keep it to ourselves and really resolve the issue between you and me that would be the ideal because i realize that hey look maybe i might be the loser in this whole thing or you might be the loser and i want you to have a fair chance just as much as i want to have a fair chance to present your case and to resolve the situation as civilly as possible right so the fact that uh now natalie bonde bonds situation is now out in the public for everybody to view for clientele like me that are now I'm not seeing this exhibit that I was interested in seeing. I wanted to see this exhibit. I'm now deprived of this experience because of something that had nothing to do with me, right? Regardless of whether Nathalie Bonzin was really creating a toxic environment or not, I now, I, I can't see this exhibit regardless. You know what I mean? Regardless of whether this was actually occurring or not right? So you have individuals that are live in the consequence, but at the end of the day, I have nothing to do with it. I didn't ask Natalie to behave however she behaved. I didn't ask any of the employees to behave or interpret the behavior in however they did, you know? Um, I know uh, some time ago, for example, uh, the Japanese uh, public transportation, I think it's the one in Tokyo, for example, they went on strike as well because they thought that, hey, we're not being paid properly, we're not being treated properly, etc. We need to fight for our rights. But rather than say, okay, we're just walking out and we're not, you know, we're not going to work, excuse me, we're not showing up, nothing. They continued to do their job. They continued to show up at their scheduled hours, but they simply did not charge their clientele for the services that they were using. So the customers still were able to go to work, still were able to do what they needed to do. So if they needed public transportation, they were able to use it. But the consequence was wholly on the company, i.e. the city of Tokyo. Now I say the city of Tokyo, I can't remember the full details. So correct me in the chat or in uh, the comments if it was another city um, or territory of Japan. But basically they kept it between the employees and the city, right? So the customers were still able to 
uh, utilize the services of public transportation. They were still able to get to and from uh, grocery, the hospital, schools, whatever they needed to do without being penalized for something that really had nothing to do with them, right? So I would have liked to have seen that here as well for um, basically what, whatever issues um, was going on between Nathalie Bonzil and the you know the employees of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts that I, I would have liked it to have stayed between the between them uh but that hey since they made it public make it fully public right make it something that we know all the details of the whole situation so if five employees said hey Natalie uh, made our work uh, very toxic, uh, gave our situation a very toxic uh, environment, put it full out. You know, since you started it, make it a full, let's know their names, let's know what was said, what was done, the dates, the times, everything. Since you decided to make it public, let's make it all public, right? Don't half-ass it, as I say, pardon my French, okay? So that's pretty much the first part that we're going to deal with, with is the, the quote unquote controversy of the firing of uh, the chief of Montreal, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, Nathalie Bonzin. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the headliner, quote unquote, of um, today's episode, which is Rebecca uh, let me get her full name, Rebecca Bellmore. And again, this is an exhibit that was shown at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. So I'm going to show share my screen here with you guys, okay? And let me just get into that here. Give me a second, guys. So I'm going to pick, now I'm going to pick one particular piece. And I have to admit, when I first saw this particular piece, it scared the crap out of me. And I'm not the, I'm, I'm not the individual that easily gets scared. And hopefully you'll, you'll see why this particular piece scared the crap out of me when I first saw it. Okay, it literally took me back because this was, it's a piece that was also seen in the Montreal Museum of Contemporary Art, which I did talk about briefly beforehand as well. So, it is this piece. <laughs> this piece scared the ever living crap out of me. <gasps> And for those of you who don't know why, this reminds me of, <coughs> excuse me, Juan or uh, um, The Grudge and The Ring, okay? For those of you who don't know, J-Horror, The Grudge and The Ring are two different movies, but in both movies you have this young Japanese woman with extremely long hair as this central villain in the movie. And... I, I guess I have to give you guys a little bit of context. When this was in a part of the museum, okay, it's in the um, quote unquote basement of, of the Montreal Museum. It's in, it's in that connective. Now, for those of you that have been on my channel, you, you've heard me speak about the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. There's a particular two levels of the Montreal Museum that connect um, several pavilions of the museum. And this was in one of those connecting levels, right? So when you go down to uh, the, the very bottom floor of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, that's the, that's the floor that will connect, I believe, at least three of the pavilions together, right? But you, ha in order to see this particular piece, the route that I had taken, I literally turned the corner and saw this back of, of it. So this 
this particular part. So I see what seems to be this woman lying on the floor, kneeling on the floor, and just a whole bunch of hair on the floor. I just stopped and literally took two steps back because I was like, my first reaction was, what the fuck? So, Part of my French is this. What the funk, you know? <laughs> I wish you were here, but what the funk is this? It basically was my first reaction to this piece, right? Because all I'm seeing is this part here, okay? All I'm seeing is the back. And to me, it's like there's this person kneeling on the floor with their hair spread out. You know, and it's reminded me right away of the grudge and the ring. So, of course, I'm I, I'm very scared. And, of course, uh, after maybe 10, 20 seconds, I realized, oh, my God, it's, you know, it's an art piece. It's part of the museum display. It's not an actual person. Oh, my God. You know, but my first reaction was WTF is this, you know, so. Uh, just so that you guys know a little bit more. So this piece is called Mixed Blessing by Rebecca Bel Belmore, who's an Ontarian artist. So she comes particularly from Toronto, Ontario, uh, the second largest, or I think it's either second or third largest city in Canada. Okay. So it's definitely one of the major cities of uh, Canada. It was acquired in 2017. So again, you guys know inventory 32.2017. So 2017 is the year that this piece was acquired and it was the 32nd item that year, meaning that there was 30, uh, 31 other pieces or items that were acquired before this one. Okay. So as you can see, uh, this piece is, uh, you know, from uh, Rebecca Belmore, who is an internationally recognized artist um, in for her performance and installation artwork. So basically, uh, she's a much more contemporary art artist. So her art is not just paintings, but as you can see, it's three dimensional works that involve uh, a whole multitude of materials. So it's not just acrylic paint on a uh, a, a paint uh, or, or palette or what have you. It's, you know, as you can see, it has, you know, hair. It has, you know, uh, it has different types of material that are going into it, right? So it's a whole bunch of different things that are put together in order to create this one particular piece, right? So um, she is uh, dealing with, as you can see, Aboriginal uh, contexts and themes and so forth. Um, I don't know if she's Aborigine herself or has a Native American heritage, but I assume that since she is talking about, she probably does have some heritage or at the very least uh, is touched by uh, Native American uh, pieces or ideas. Okay. Hi, blind guy, his wife, their life. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, Netflix. Netflix, <laughs> YouTube uh, does that sometimes where for whatever reason, it doesn't send out notification, but thank you for being here. And I also know that a lot of people are probably watching um, Uncle Stu who has a live at the moment as well. But thank you for stopping by and for spending whatever amount of time that you have with me. I know that you were here with me this morning when I was reading a little bit with you guys. So thank you again for spending some time with me. Um, I appreciate any support that you or anybody else listening will give me. So uh, we'll continue on with um, everything else that we have to talk about with Rebecca. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, we're talking about a little bit about Rebecca Belmore, who had a, an exhibit called uh, Braver le Monumental. So um, 
how could I translate that into English? Bravi le mot. Bravi is basically French for being being courageous. Le monumental is monumental. So uh, being courageous in front of the monumental, essentially, I guess would be a just translation of this exhibit uh, from Rebecca Belmore. Okay. So that's the first piece that we saw from her. Now, this piece, you know, was, like I said, also at the Contemporary Art Museum of uh, Montreal. So we're going to show another little uh, piece, and it's actually a video. So hopefully it will play. So let me get that. One second, guys, and hopefully the video will play as well because I think it's important that you guys see some videos as well. So as you hear, um, she she's a modern, really much more of a modern artist where she has uh, pieces like that one where it's not just um, the sculpture, which is what I showed you earlier, but also, uh, <coughs> excuse me, movies and so forth where she uh, interacts. So this is a scene. Um, that was actually uh, filmed in Montreal uh, as well. So she's an artist that really tries to implicate. Now, I, I think I made a mistake. Um, this was an uh, art uh, exhibit that was at the Montreal Contemporary Art Museum and not at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. But the piece that I saw, showed earlier uh, was also at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. But she's a very much a contemporary artist where she has paintings, photos, sculptures. Uh, so she really uh, implicates a lot of different types of art. So she's not just a painter or just a sculptor. She really uh, goes in different mediums uh, to show her ideas and thoughts and so forth. Okay. Um, so I'll show one more piece here uh, from Rebecca Belmore, okay, so that way you guys can have a sense of what kind of artist that she is. One second, guys, I'm trying to get to the right the right piece here one second guys so as you can see this is wave sound so this is a large sculpture that she has in many different places in many different forms. This was also shown, shown part of uh, the exhibit that she had at the Contemporary Museum of uh, Contemporary Art of Montreal. Uh, but as you can see, it's a piece that she has uh, shown in many different forms in many different places. With contemporary art, a lot of the times what they do is that they'll have the same art piece but they'll create two, three, 10, 20 different pieces of the same work. So that way they can show it at several different places at the same time. Now, um, I'm not too sure why I'd have to look into it, but basically 
when you have seven pieces or less, it's considered as a unique piece of work. But the second that there's eight or more, um, it's considered as mass production. Okay. So I'm not too sure why they, you know, it was seven versus eight, but basically once you have seven pieces or less, it's considered as unique items, a unique piece. Uh, but once it's eight or more, it's considered as mass production. Okay. So you have this piece that was here. Um, it is located, as you can see, at the uh, Gross Moor National Park, which is found in Newfoundland and Labrador. And of course, uh, before the billion, since he played that geographic game, he knows exactly where Newfoundland and Labrador is. If he doesn't, make sure you tell him to go on the map and tell, show you where exactly Newfoundland and, La Newfoundland and Labrador are. Okay. And while you're at it, ask him where Sweden is. Okay. Okay. I know before the billions, I'm not letting you letting that down for you. Okay. So uh, this is a piece, like I said, she created multiple copies of it and is found at multiple, multiple different places. Okay. So um, this is a very interesting piece, and it, it reminds you, of course, of that, that the horns that are often used in quote unquote war movies, where they quote unquote sound the trumpets of war, and they kind of you see this warrior blow into it and announce that hey, the war has started, etc. Uh, but it also reminds me, I, I don't know about you guys, it reminds me a little bit of a cornucopia as well. So that kind of idea of of harvest and bounty. So, of course, for my American friends who recently celebrated uh, Thanksgiving, it could remind you of that as well, of, of food and bounty and sharing a meal, breaking bread, as they say, with your family and or friends, right? So, we won't go any further in with Rebecca. What I really want to show you guys tonight is one of the features of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. They have um, this feature, like a lot of museums of uh, fine arts in particular, but also of other kinds of museums around the world, where, like I said, you can see the collection that they have online for free. So take advantage of that, guys. Um, you could literally visit uh, the British Museum, uh, you know, the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, the Met, what have you. You can visit it online 24-7, any day, any time. As long as you have a reliable internet connection, you could visit it. So the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts has this feature where you can visit a variety of collections that it has online for free. One of those exhibits is called Ecologies or Ecology. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and share that experience with, with you guys. Now, I've already seen this exhibit, but I'm hoping Nathalie Vincent and um, Wealth Engineering, if you guys are still serious about visit in the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts that you do want to take a minute to go visit the museum and visit this exhibit with me if you really want to, okay? But we are going to share together this experience and visit the museum uh, together and visit the uh, ecology exhibit together. So I'm just going to take a moment to share the screen again with you guys, and hopefully you guys enjoy this uh, with me. So this is uh, the first step into getting into the ecology, a song for our planet. That's the name of this exhibit. Okay. Now I did take um, obviously photos of this entire exhibit. Okay, so 
Um, I will try to link um, my photos that I took of this exhibit so that you, where you guys can see all these different items. So obviously you guys already have a basic idea of where to go for this. So we're gonna go straight to this first one here, okay? So this is in uh, the S1, or sorry, S2. So the, the lowest level that you can go in the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. So we have this particular piece, which is buffaloes, as you can see, okay? So I'm gonna go to, sorry, I accidentally closed my um, page. One second, guys, I'm gonna get to, because I do want to describe to you guys what this piece that you guys are seeing. So just give me a second to get back to the page that I was on and that I had all the information ready so that way I can talk to you guys a little bit. Now I won't go piece by piece because I do want you guys to go ahead on this page and be able to see for yourself what this experience is like, okay? So this particular piece is called Beyond Redemption by Adrian, uh, Adrian Stinson, okay? It is made by actual uh, bison and bison hides. So what you're seeing here is actually uh, the remains of actual living bison. So at one point, all the animals that you see here were actually alive at some point, right? Now, I can only hope that these animals died in, um, you know, a peaceful manner, but I have no way of knowing for sure what exactly happened. Um, so hopefully these animals died, and were already passed away when the artist decided to use their fur and or remains in order to create these, this particular piece. But this particular piece was also found at the National Gallery of Canada. So this piece has traveled in many different uh, museums in many different exhibits as well. So what you're seeing here is actual uh, fur, actual animals, actual bison. Now there might be a certain element, especially this red part that you're seeing at the bottom is obviously synthetic or fake, okay? Um, so don't worry, there's a certain amount of um, you know, synthetic involved in here, but um, Adrian uh, Stinson uh, uses bison often in his uh, artwork. Um, it is um, a part of his Native American heritage. He is of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, what's called, I'm, I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing the word here, but hopefully um, I'm saying it properly. So for anybody who knows how to pronounce this properly, do let me know. He is of uh, Sika Nation. So he is Native American by heritage and bisons are uh, very important, important in his culture, okay? So we're going to move on to the next piece, okay? Uh, we're going to go to this particular piece. So at the bottom here, as you can see, are these lily pads, okay? And um, I'm going to go into my photos of that section. So give me a second here, guys, so that I can find the information. So do take your time to enjoy looking at these photos and really take in your analysis of what you're seeing. So the lily pads, or as they're called by the artist, hibernation of water lilies. It is done by Lisette Lemieux. I will repeat that again, Lisette 
le mieux. L I S E T T E is the first name le mieux or the best. L I L E M I E U X Lisette le mieux who uh, was born in uh, uh, Arthabasca, Quebec in 1943. Uh, so basically these are 55 impressions of jazz, uh, Japanese butter bar leaves. Okay, so basically lily pads, essentially. Now, of course, when we look at lily pads, we think that they're solid when in reality, they are not. There's a few videos of people trying to step onto lily pads and then just sinking right through them because they're very, the uh, lily pads are, are normally very small leaves that are basically strung together, okay? So they're not just this one solid form of leaf here. So basically, this is what... Um, you're seeing here is these lily pads, right? So of course here are, the, are, are basically white impressions. So you kind of get the impression that um, the artist just put a cast uh, on lily pads and just took the impression of them, that they're not actually lily pads because obviously lily pads would be normally green um, and of course, in the middle of it, you would have flowers and so forth. While as here, you have these very white, fairly large uh, leaves, but they're not actual, you know, you, do, you get the sense that they're not actual representations of the actual leaves themselves. And then, of course, right here, we're going to look at this particular piece right here which is, of course, for those of you who don't know, a snowmobile. <laughs> Blind guy, I hope you do visit the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts sometime soon. Uh, I think it's worth visiting, whether it's virtually or in person. So this is a virtual exhibit. Uh, Blind guy, his wife, their life, Le Cori, as we know, or like Quita and or Corey, is this a, a virtual tour that you guys could actually take if you wanted to. So even though I know you may not be able to visit Montreal anytime soon, um, hopefully we'll take the time to visit the tour virtually. In fact, you know what? I'm going to put the link of, um, of the virtual tour. So what I'm going to put now in the chat is the link of the virtual tour so that you can visit the museum virtually. So even if you can't come to Montreal and visit this particular exhibit in person, hopefully you'll be able to visit it in, in, uh, in the digitized world virtually. And there's other um, exhibits that you can visit virtually as well. So even if you can't come in person, Hopefully, you'll be able to visit it in uh, in the streams, as they say, right? So I do hope that you take the time to enjoy visiting the Museum of Fine Arts virtually, okay? Uh, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> You're very welcome, and I hope uh, just as much as you keep me alive, I always look forward, uh, Lequita, to your shows with you and your husband, on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The only what the bleep, 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 <laughs> that I enjoy uh, hearing about during my weekdays. So I'm looking forward to your next episode tomorrow morning and of course, Thursday and Friday. So for those of you guys that are uh, new to the channel, please give a big shout out to Laquita and her husband, Corey uh, from Blind Guy, his wife, their life. So if you heard about them through me, tell them I sent you, tell them she stole my thunder, recommended me, and do uh, spend some time watching their shows. They have different panelists coming on and are out there teaching us how to become 
better YouTubers, better people. And of course, there are vigilantes. I mean, uh, <clears throat> great uh, content creators when it comes to uh, having us eating more fruits and vegetables. And, and you guys kind of make me feel bad sometimes because a lot of times when you ask how many fruits and vegetables you're eating, a lot of times all I have to say is, yeah, I had my morning tea and that's about it. Um, a lot of times that's a, the good and bad thing with my lifestyle is I only have to go to work for 1 p.m. So a lot of the times by the time I wake up, it's time to go to work. So I don't always have the time to have a proper breakfast before going to work. So I'm not always able to eat my fruits and vegetables. But it's a good thing that you guys are reminding us that, hey, look, regardless of what you're eating, just add a banana, add a I add a potato, something, anything. Uh, just get those fruits and vegetables in. And I tease you guys, but no, it's it's good work that you guys are doing. So we're going to continue on with this other piece, this hanging, hanging from the ceiling piece here. Um, so we're going to talk a, a little bit about this. So just give me a second to get you the information about this particular piece here. So, of course, it is uh, a skidoo, as it's often called here in um, Montreal. And here we also have a particular, I, 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 it's feel, it feels funny to say, we have, quote, unquote, bike lanes for skidoos. So, if you're in what, here in Montreal, we have uh, different expressions that, to talk about different parts of the island of Montreal. So basically, the West Island, like uh, the title would say, the western part of the island of Montreal is more of the suburban areas. But we also have, um, that's, that's a part of the Montreal island that's still very suburban, very, there's lots of agricultural land, lots of forest lands and so forth. So there's part of it where you would have past forest skidoos for uh, these kinds of machinery that uh, would go around. But this is also something that you would see in uh, the northern parts of Montreal or the more rural rural parts of um, the province, okay? So this particular piece is called Arctic Power, right? So they're using a literal snowmobile okay is the proper term for this machine a snowmobile that has been damaged and they're um turn it into art which is really what's uh, so interesting about modern art is that you can take anything and any everything and turn it into art uh you have this damaged snowmobile you know, most of us just look at it as if this is just a form of transportation, right? This is just a way of getting from point A to point B. Most of us would not look at a snowmobile and think, oh, this is art. This is beauty. This is something to be shown in a museum of fine arts. Yet the artist, a BGL, which is a collective of various artists, have done that. They've done just that. They've turned this... Uh, piece of functioning um work you know this snowmobile that's been damaged um unfortunately they don't go into a whole lot of detail as to how it was damaged when it was damaged etc was the damage intentional was it an accident etc and they turned it into a piece of art right so they used um, what's called spray glue, salt, and velvet flakes on this uh, snowmobile and turned it into a piece of art. And so they hung it up, and now it's representative uh, almost of the reality that we have right now. So we have this thing that, because what can you really do with a damaged snowmobile, right? Um, this only either repair it right so you you continue using it if it's fixed and it's uh, something that's still operable you're still using it 
or you throw it out in the garbage, right? That's the only choices that most of us, when we're looking at a, a, a car or a bus or whatever other piece of transportation, when it's so damaged that you, you can't use it as a bus anymore, what options do you have other than throwing it out in the garbage? But these artists, BGL, so um, let's say B for bus, G for George, L for Larry, they decided, no, 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 let's let's give this this broken, this damaged piece of uh, of transportation and give it a new life. Let's give it a new meaning and let's let's make it into a piece of art, right? It's not the uh, the prettiest. I mean, I don't I don't look at this and say, wow, how beautiful! Oh my God, this is. This is amazing. This is awesome. To me, this it's not pretty at all. It doesn't look nice, but I see that they've um, you know regained purpose. And that's the whole point of this exhibit is things that we would consider as ugly, as futile, as the things that are shameful almost uh, of our modern world. Um, I showed earlier, of course, um, these bison furs that were now being displayed as artwork, right? How we, in our modern world of industrial industrialization, how, for lack of a, of, of a better word, and, and pardon my my expression, I'm, I'm going to use something that may be a little bit offensive here, guys. So if you're a little bit sensitive, do cover your ears here. Um, we, we, for again, a lack of a better word, and I do know that I'm risking um, my monetization by saying this, we almost raped basically the, the natural world, right? So by doing so, we, we, we basically destroyed nature, right? Nature is no longer what it used to be because of us, right? Uh, the bison in, in the U.S. and the beaver here in Canada were, were near dis the extent of what uh, we did, essentially. Um, I know that maybe a year or two ago, uh, Canada donated several bisons to the U.S. because for the longest time, uh, the only where the only place you could find "quote unquote" American bisons were in Canada. <laughs> we had uh, quite a few individual animals that were technically uh, "quote unquote" American bisons uh, in Canada. And we donated a few of these individuals to the U.S. so that the American bisons could hopefully rebuild its population. And um, Canada basically had to put uh, the beaver, our national uh, animal, uh, in the endangered, uh, endangered species list and had to intervene in order to protect these animals. So with this particular piece that you're seeing on screen now, uh, you're seeing that representation of how we as mankind, as humankind, um, intervened and basically destroyed our world. And now we have to sort of see the beauty in that destruction almost um, in order to hopefully uh, see that our world is still worth protect and hopefully hopefully you know now again this is just my personal interpretation of all of this um if you guys have a, a different interpretation or different thoughts of what i'm saying please uh do let me know no problem uh definitely glad to, that you and i hope that you do take the time to go visit and see the, the this exhibit on your own uh share it with your friends and i have it's my pleasure to shout you guys out you guys do take the time to shout me out it's the least i can do 
Um, and by all means, I try to, I know that you have a, a couple of uh, playlists by and by his wife, their lives. And I do try to take the time to play your uh, playlist to give you those watch hours as well. And it's well worth the time uh, because again, your, your, your shows, your interviews, you have great panels that come up. And I do hope that you enjoy uh, watching this particular video and or that you take the time to uh, visit the museum at the very least virtually. And uh, yeah, it, it does look like a trash heap, unfortunately. Uh, but that's um, the, the whole point of this particular exhibit, Ecology or Ecologies, um, is uh, to show the, the, the negative impact that we as human beings have on the world. And as much as we would like to think that we're evolved and we're doing so such wondrous, wonderful things, for uh, ourselves and for naturality, we're creating a lot of trash. Unfortunately, uh, there's quite a few um, trash heaps or plastic heaps in the ocean that are, are very shameful, unfortunately, that uh, this is the consequence of our world. So I won't keep you guys for too, too much longer. Um, I will show a couple of more pieces um, in this virtual tour. So as you can see with the virtual tour, what's great is that you can, as you can see, you can move around and kind of take it at, at your own pace, okay? So I'm just gonna go here a little bit um, and try to find the particular piece that I want to talk to you guys about. Um, because again, it is going to be of one of my personal favorite artists, if we can get to it. Okay, let me get to the right angle. Okay. So it's not the best. Um, let me see here. If I can... I really want to be able to show you guys this artwork at the best possible angle. There we go. That's that's a better. Okay. There we go. Okay. Oops. It's a little too close. Sorry, guys. It's hard to navigate this a little bit. Okay. All right. So this is uh an art piece from one of my favorite artists and for those of you who know this was one of the first or i should say the first uh let's talk the arts come to life episode where i talked about kent monkman so kent k-e-n-t monkman m-o-n-k-m-a-n kent monkman um, so he is one of uh, my favorite artists, I have to admit. Uh, he is of Cree and Irish descent. Um, he is part of the LGBTQ plus uh, community. I don't mention this out of, uh, you know, to disparage him or to use it against him. Um, he openly admits that he is part of the community, that he is transgender, and that he uses this in his work. Uh, one of his alter egos is Miss Chief. There is a lot longer title to this uh, particular persona that he takes on, but it, this, is, this is something that he integrates into his artwork. Um, and this is one of his particular pieces. We'll log, we'll getting closer to this as you can see oops sorry guys need to get closer in here okay doesn't seem to want me to get very close up to that particular piece here so i know it's grayed out but if you see in the center of the circle so that's kind of where you would see his persona mischief um 
Okay, so unfortunately, it's not allowing me to get much closer, unfortunately. Okay, but I'll see if I can find this particular artwork in my in my photos that I took of um, of that particular exhibit. So sorry for the dead air, guys. But uh, Ken Mungman is um, both very interesting and very controversial because, again, um, when it comes to um, the LGBTQ plus community, um, obviously it, it's something that is politicized for better or for worse. People uh, will have their ideas uh, of the community whether it is as a whole or individually. Um, I have no problems discussing uh, the community uh, either as individuals or as a whole, but as long as you guys are keeping the discussion respectful, uh, I don't mind having that discussion. So I'm going to show you guys a little bit. I'm gonna sh stop sharing the screen in a second and I'm going to share my particular photos that I took just so that you guys have a better sense of what uh, this image is. So just give me a second here. Hello, Destination Dad. So glad that you're here again. I hope that your audio has been resolved. Um, so I'm going to show you guys uh, this particular image of uh, the artwork we were just looking at in a moment so just give me a second to get to sharing my screen again with you guys and it is also a um painting that i did use in uh my first so as you can see this is the more zoomed up version so as you can see uh, the gentleman on the right is, of course, Miss Chief. And, of course, you have this very European gentleman. And, of course, you do see a little bit. Okay. It's obviously very colorful painting. Okay. Very unique. Okay. So, obviously, I won't share too, too much of that. But, um, obviously, Kent Monkman is like i said part of the lgbtq uh, community and he does by intention use his transgenderness in his artwork so he goes under the persona of Miss chief and that's what you saw in that close-up uh the gentleman on the right was Miss chief aka kent monkman uh, Kent Monkman is Miss Chief. Miss Chief is Kent Monkman. Um, and a lot of the times he'll use uh, that alter ego to sort of question um, Canadian history and the, the normal narrative that we have in Canada as to the quote unquote founded fathers of Canada and how we see Canadian history. Because obviously, uh, history is often told by the quote-unquote victors, by the people that won the war and, you know, sort of uh, have control of the country, right? So, of course, for Canada, that was Anglophone Britain. That was English Britain, right? Uh, they're the ones that uh, have had control of the country basically for the past 200 years, give or take, right? Um, so obviously with Kent Monkman, he comes in and sort of destroys that narrative and says, no, no, you might want to come out here and glorify England and glorify that world, but I'm saying that how you perceive reality is very different from how we, uh, the Native Americans, experience Yes, uh, Destination Dad, 
history is written by the winners. Absolutely. So with uh, somebody like Kent Monkman, he says, no, 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 I'm going to rewrite that and I'm going to give my perspective as somebody who's native, as somebody who is part of the LGBTQ plus community, and at least give my attempt to rewrite that history and give my perspective of it and tell you guys that as much as you want to think that uh, Canada is wonderful and perfect in reality as a Native American, as a Native person, uh, my life in Canada was not great. It was not fantastic. It was not wonderful. It might have been that way for several Canadians, but it certainly wasn't that way for the Native Americans. Okay, so that's why he uses uh, his sexuality, um, his perspective as a Native American to sort of um, question that perspective and to really say that, hey, look, things might have been great for you, but they weren't great for me. Okay, so it's a bit controversial, um, but that's what I love about Kent Monkman is that he assumes his sexuality, he assumes his life and uses it to tell his story and his perspective and really show that even though Canada is a great country, that it is far from perfect, that it has a lot of things that it should be ashamed of. Um, Canada has a better reputation than it deserves. Um, and this is say, you know, I'm Canadian. I was born and raised in Canada. And uh, we have a better reputation than what we deserve, unfortunately. I wish we could come out here and say, that Canada has never been racist, never been prejudiced, never been against anybody. But unfortunately, uh, that's not the truth. Um, the Japanese, the Chinese, Native Americans, Black people, and various other ethnic minorities will have individual stories and collective stories of um, racism, of discrimination, of basically being treated unfairly based on their ethnicity or religion or uh, sexual preference. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, every community does have a political agenda for better or for worse, you know, and we tend to forget that as much as we would like to separate our ethnicity from political, um, we are political for better or for worse you know um and it's having that discernment of knowing when it's political and when it's just individual perception is very difficult that we do it's extremely difficult and i have to ask myself sometimes too um you know because i you know i experienced that too when you know i, I i'm sure you have too that there's individuals that will call you the n-word and you kind of have to ask yourself, is it just that individual? Is it political? Is it what's going on here? You know, and having that discernment of knowing when it's an individual experience, when it's political, when it's something else that's going on. It's very difficult to have that, that, um, that discernment and that sense of, okay, this is just somebody that's angry or yes, this is political, yes, this is quote unquote systemic racism, right? It's difficult to have that discernment. It's not always obvious. Not everything is political, not everything is racist, not everything is horrible, not everything is evil. Sometimes people are just assholes, you know, for lack of a better word, pardon my French. Um, you know, you kind of have to uh, ask yourself when is it political and when is just somebody being being stupid essentially for lack of a better word right pardon me if, uh, me if i laughing but you know it's it's it, life is difficult and we we tend to forget that we're we're not just human beings we're political we're religious we're musicians we're artists we're one thing we're everything we're nothing at all you know and it's uh we can't always separate uh things as much as we would like to and make it as clean cut as we would like it to be. But alas, I don't, I'm not out here to preach. I'm not out here to make things political that aren't. 
Um, so um, that's pretty much it for tonight. I just want to at least give you guys the opportunity to uh, watch this particular exhibit, Ecology or Ecologies, okay? I did uh, Destination Dad. If you want, I did put the link to being able to see uh, this exhibit for yourself virtually online. I did post it in the chat earlier on. So if you want to see this uh, exhibit for yourself, you're more than welcome to, to do so. I will put in the description the same link as well as the link to my photos that I took of that particular exhibit. So if you want a more up close, individualized um, uh view of the uh, different uh, photos or uh, I should say sculptures or artifacts is actually the better word. Um, you're more than welcome to do so. I will, like I said, put that in the description. So for those of you that want to have uh, a better individual link uh, or view of the items, that's absolutely fine. Yep, for sure. I definitely agree. Not everybody's polished. And uh, thank you for enjoying uh, my storytelling. So thank you guys, uh, Blind Guy, uh, his wife, their life, and Destination Dad for being here. I know that uh, Wally and Peter and Investor M were also here. Thank you guys for spending this time with me. I won't keep you guys any here longer. I'm hoping that Uncle Stu is still alive uh, because I haven't had a chance to really uh, see his live. But in any event, guys, thank you for being here with me tonight and spending 20, 30 minutes with me talking about arts. And I hope that you guys watched whatever part that you missed in the replay. If not, I'll see you guys tomorrow with Blind Guy, his wife, their life. I know you guys will have a live at 11.15. Destination Dad, I hope you do go on live soon um, because I do find you very interesting and I did enjoy your live last night as well. Um, so I'll see you guys in the streams. Everybody here knows how I end things. Um, so if there's somebody that you have not said I love you to or that you haven't hugged in a while, this is the time. Do it now, like Melissa Berrien would say, right? Do it. Do it now. It's never too late to tell somebody that you love them. Uh, it's never too late to say I love you, to hug them or whatever that you need to somebody that you know. You know you need to tell them that you love them. You know you need to hug them. Come on, do it. Do it now. It's never too late. So uh, I hope to see you guys in the streams. Au revoir. Yes, yes. Blind guy, his wife, they're like, au revoir, bonsoir, good night. And I hope to see you guys in the streams, uh, whether it's mine, Destination Dads, Blind guy, his wife, their life, Wally, uh, uh, Peter, Bly, uh, before the billions, Uncle Stu, I hope to see you guys soon. Uh, it's never too soon to see you guys. In fact, I miss you guys already. I miss you. <laughs> Have a great night, guys, and thank you for being here.